I'm Stephen Stone from The Absolute Sound, and can you hear me? I'm so sorry. <laughs> can you um, hear me now? Can you hear me, <laughs> hear me now? Right? You don't watch too much TV, do you? Um, this, this seminar is, is about iTunes and iPods and how to get the most out of them. Um, actually, I, I write for The Absolute Sound, and I've been writing about audio for about 30 years. So you would kind of think, given that amount of time in audio, that I would be very hardcore turntables, you know, take my tone arm out of my dying hands sort of a guy. But I'm not for the, for the principal reason that I'm old enough to know that I have a finite amount of time left on this earth. And I want to spend a maximum amount of time of it listening to music, not looking for music, not screwing around with hardware, but enjoying music. And in that way, iTunes and iPod are wonderful in that you have immediate access to a great deal of music and with a minimum amount of aggravation. So the ergonomics of iTunes and the iPod cannot be disputed. There are, there are people who will dispute that iTunes and, I, and iPod are not the highest fidelity medium as they are when they're stock. And that's kind of what we're all about here in this seminar, is how to raise above that stock level of, of audio quality. Actually, a couple of questions I'd like to ask. How many people here use iTunes? Excellent. Whoa. How many people here use iPods? Oh, geez. Oh, God, you guys are going to know more than we do. Right but <laughs> that's great. Uh, I mean, and it's good for us because it gives us an idea of what kind of level of, of, of talk we can do. Um, you may notice you've got file cards. Did everybody get a, like, blank file card? Yeah. yeah? Oh, good. Those are for writing questions down on. And during the course of while we're talking here, if you just pass your cards down, and put a name on it and put like, a, like where you're from, you know, Mars, whatever. Um, and I'm going to be reading the questions after we finish an initial kind of, everyone's going to get a couple minutes to talk and describe what it is their products do in relation to iTunes and iPod. And then I'm going to basically open the floor to questions. Um, I do have prizes for questions I read off and the question that we decide we like the best gets the best prize. I've got this bag of swag. I fully intend to have nothing left in it when we finish at the end of the seminar. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Steve Nugent and let him describe what it is his products do and how they relate to iTunes and iPod. And then when he, I'm going to kind of keep track of everyone's time and we'll work our way down and then we'll go to questions. That's it. OK. Uh, well, my company is Empirical Audio. and. Uh, our beginnings were <laughs> modest and you know starting with cables and then mods and then finally a customer sent me a thing called a transit and said you know can you make this thing sound better so that's where I started in computer audio and it turned out to be a great marriage between my background which is computer audio industry for 25 years and uh, combined with my uh, love of music and doing audiophile systems I'm a systems kind of guy so after that transit event uh, and, and modifying lots of other products, the customers kept bugging me and saying, why don't you just design your own stuff? And so I finally got to the point where I had the wherewithal to do that and, and started doing it. And my first product, which is now in third generation, is called an off-ramp. Off-ramp's USB converter. So if you have a DAC or a receiver, most of you guys don't have receivers, but some of you might. Uh, receiver or DAC or a, a processor, sound sound processor, and you want to connect it to a computer and drive it, you know, with files from a computer uh, using, say, iTunes. Uh, you need some kind of an interface adapter, and <coughs> there are several adapters available that can do that now. Uh, notably, Wired, Firefa FireWire, and uh, USB, and um, you know, people ask me often, is there really an advantage of one over the other? And, and there really isn't in my mind. Um, you know, one of them was maybe designed more for this kind of job and it's used more widely by studios and all, but um, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with USB and it can work very fine as a, as, a, as a music interface to your computer. And so that's what the off-ramp does. It, it gives you uh, several options for digital output 
that can feed your DAC you know, using I, iTunes. Um, my second product, and <clears throat> by the way, I'll, I'll go into more detail, I think, uh, because Steve's probably going to ask me more questions about that product and maybe my other products. Um, but I, the, my approach to my, all of my products is, is really more from an RF and almost instrumentation standpoint. If you look inside my products, they're designed more like what you would see in a Tektronix oscilloscope than in what you would see in a Sony CD player, right? So uh, I'm real anal about you know, getting the transmission line effects you know, taken care of, dealing with all the RF artifacts, and you know, notably just you know, trying, to, trying to be the best I can at, do, at doing the best design. And so I hand lay out every one of my boards I lay every trace down myself. I don't use auto routers. And I do whatever it takes to get the optimum performance out of it. So that's throughout all of my products. So I consider myself, you know, uh, well, I'm sure John's probably got good products too that do a lot of these same things because I consider him a cohort in the industry and he's the equivalent of what I am too. So, but anyway, that, that's what I think sets me apart from a lot of other companies. My second product is, uh, what's called a pace car, and it's now in second generation. And the idea there was, when, with the advent of all these Wi-Fi devices like the Sonos, first it started out with the squeeze box, Airport Express and squeeze box. Those were sort of the first ones that popped out. Um, that, you know, they're really easy to use, interesting products, no wires laying across the carpet. Um, but the sound quality was, was fairly poor with them. And <clears throat> it's primarily jitter. Was, was the issue with them. So um, I set out to design a, a product that would pretty much adapt to all sorts of different devices and reduce the jitter to an acceptable audio file level. Um, unlike a lot of manufacturers that claim that they get zero jitter or eliminate jitter, that's not possible. Uh, but we do try to remove as much as possible, lower it to the point where it's not objectionable to the audio file and it's not. So there's other things that pop up as, as the problems in the system and it's not just jitter. Um, so that's what the pace car does and what it does is actually clocks in the data. So it's a data in, data out, digital device and it clocks the data into a FIFO and it stores a certain amount of data in there and then it uses a, a local clock to clock the data back out. Now it likes to do that synchronously but it doesn't have to do it synchronously. And what I mean by synchronous is if you provide a clock to the device <clears throat> that's feeding the data and you tell it, I want you to feed me at this rate, then it's synchronous. And the, the rate that the data is coming is always going to be the same as the rate that's going out. They're always going to match. Um, the other option is an asynchronous situation where you don't really know what the rate is coming in. And you would you'd say, well, all these things are crystal controlled. And, and they're all very precise rates, you know, 44.1 kilohertz is 44.1 kilohertz. But the fact is that laptops, PCs, Macs, airport expresses, they all have widely different frequencies. And we're talking about a frequency that's fairly high to start with. So if we're at a 44.1 sample rate, the frequency of the master clock at that rate is actually 11.2896 megahertz. So it's fairly easy to have that be 11. 0.28965 megahertz, right? It's just a tiny bit off. But those tiny bits uh, are all it takes to overrun a FIFO. It's like you have a cart and you're putting, putting uh, <coughs> plates on the cart as you wash them, and then somebody's taking them off and putting them in the cabinet. And they're, t and they're OK, I'm not worrying. <laughs> and so the plates coming on and going off have to be at the same rate, or the, or the plate, otherwise the, the cart's going to go empty, or the plates are going to fall on the floor and it's going to have too many plates. Right? So that's exactly what happens. And so the other option is it's coming at you, and you don't know how many plates are coming and, and when they're coming. So what you have to do then is you have to adapt to the plates. You have to adapt the clock to the plates. So the pace car is also capable of doing that. So I can take any generic device, like a transport or an airport express or an Apple TV, and I can adapt to that rate. So it's a, a very flexible device. Now my final device is, is my newest product, my overdrive DAC. Uh, and that combines the off-ramp, so it has a, a USB interface, with some of the other elements 
Um, once I tackled the first two elements that I think are really, or the first element that I think is really important, which is jitter, eliminate jitter, or not eliminate, but it minimize jitter. The other two are really important elements, and there's actually a fourth I'm going to talk about too uh, later. The second element is really clean D to A conversion. And that means minimize the effects of digital filtering. That means uh, minimize the number of analog stages. If there are any stages, make them class A so you don't have crossover distortion. I mean, really get anal about making this super simple and like an NOS DAC or a non-oversampling DAC. And so that's, that was my approach there. And then final, the third one, and this is a really important element, is eliminate the preamp. I think some of you will be shocked at how much noise and distortion your preamps add, even if they're the very best ten to $50,000 preamps. They're not even close, trust me. You get rid of that preamp, and the music will just open up and become magic. So that's what, those are the three things I've accomplished with my overdrive DAC. So I'm really excited about that DAC. And I have a, a, a really state-of-the-art system over here playing that incorporates a lot of these functions, and it really uses my components to their, to their maximum. And, and what room is that in? That's in the iris room. OK. Yeah. Your time is up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, hello, my name is Jonathan Reichback. I work at Sonic Studio. Um, at Sonic Studio, we've been doing digital audio for about 26 years now. Uh, we started back in late 80s working on restoration uh, for movies, in fact. And we developed, over the years, we've developed many uh, firsts for digital audio for studios. We were the first pre-mastering system, the first system to do 96K, the first 48 track system, the first DSD system, the first uh, networked audio system. So over the last 25 years, um, our company has been pretty much involved with the state of the art for digital audio. Our customers over those 25 years have primarily been all the big studios who we buy our music from. So Sony Music, Universal, Warner Brothers, and hundreds of small companies have been using our software for 20 years now to master the CDs and DVDs that you've been listening to. So for all these years, I've been writing the software for these studios, and to be perfectly honest, I never wrote it for me. So about two years ago, I use iTunes just like everybody else, and two years ago for Christmas, I decided to rewrite my software to work with iTunes so I could use it myself. So our approach has been to take what's good of iTunes, which is the user interface because it's easy to use, and actually try to improve upon the aspects where we can with iTunes. And primarily that has to do with how it sounds. Um, there are a couple features with iTunes. It's wonderful to use, but it's not necessarily the greatest for high resolution music. Um, some of those can be the volume control is not necessarily the best. Uh, the EQ is kind of pathetic. Um, the fact that the iTunes basically does sample rate conversion on the fly makes it pretty hard for us to manage our digital libraries. So because of all those things, I decided that I wanted to fix that, and I took our software and modified it to work under the hood, so to speak, with iTunes. So with our software, you use iTunes, but when you actually go to play a file, we take over from iTunes and we play the file uh, using our software that the studios have been using. So basically, our approach has been is to take the best of iTunes, which is the interface and the ease of use, and then try to make it sound better. And that's basically what Sonic Studio has been working on the last couple of years with Amara. OK? That's it. <laughs> hey, all. I'm Michael Mercer. I uh, write for Positive Feedback and a few other websites. So I guess I'm the odd man out here. Um, blogger, blagger. I report on all the stuff they're talking about. Um, my background, I went from working for the Absolute Sound to Atlantic Records, so I got to learn about the playback end and the production end, and I take that experience and I put it into my reporting. Um, first, I just want to say I'm so excited, you know, having been involved and so passionate about this industry, uh, just to see a panel like this about iPods. You know, just a few years ago, I was running into, you know, a lot of uphill battles trying to get dealers on board, trying to, you know, encourage them to have people bring in their iPods and, you know, because you can really maximize it. And a lot of that is 
by using stuff like these guys make. You know, I think that a big portion of it is the digital to analog conversion. You know, and USB can work. You know, I've used plenty of USB DACs, and you can integrate it into your Hi-Fi system. And it's like iTunes and an iPod. It's like anything else. It is what you make it. I mean, if you, you know, compress your files a lot, they're going to sound compressed. If you don't, and you have your system set up properly, it's going to sound just as great. And never before have we had such great access to music. I mean, there are so many great sites, you know, um, you know, Pandora, uh, Rhapsody, um, Spotify, which is going to be coming soon to this uh, country. It's in Europe right now. It's high res streaming audio. I mean, never before could you find, you know, so much music at your fingertips and play it back. And yes, a lot of it's compressed, but it's like, it's, a, it's any other tool, you know, and you just learn how to use it well. Um, there's also some great sites to learn about how to do this, computeraudiofile.com, um, iLounge, uh, HeadFi has a good amount of information. Um, they're all interactive. You know, people post about the experiences they're having, and sometimes some of us, you know, reviewers, the ones, you know, behind the lines, so to speak, you know, chime in and try to, try to, you know, encourage them to try new things. But I just, it's a source like any other, iTunes and an iPod. It's just a matter of, yes, whether it's a USB DAC or an off-ramp or a Wadia DAC, so you can come digitally out of your iPod into a DAC of your preference. The tools are there. And I just, I would encourage everyone to do as much research as possible. Like I said, those sites that I mentioned, um, I do a lot of writing about the stuff on positive feedback. Um, Stereophiles has done some great coverage. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited to see a panel like this and to see so many faces here. I think it's a tremendous thing, really. Um, so that's what I have to the say about guys. it. The other guys, yeah. Hello everyone, I'm John Schaefer. I'm from Wadia Digital. Um, Wadia is a 22-year-old company that has always focused on digital audio. <clears throat> and uh, when, when our founders started the company, they were trying to figure out why digital, you know, the emerging CD format didn't really sound very musical. And they came up with a lot of really interesting ideas on um, mostly ideas that were either uh, recognizing a problem and then addressing it and coming up with a solution or looking at other industries and seeing where other people had solved problems with moving digital data and then applying it. And a lot of the early work that we did really kind of um, allowed people to start to think about um, digital audio and, and, and music off of a CD offering high performance. And I think we earned a special place in the hearts of a lot of audiophiles because we really made some significant progress. And as time has gone on, we've evolved all of our digital technologies and we've worked really hard on things like making sure we're always bit accurate, making sure we're moving the data without it being corrupted, making sure that we minimize timing errors, which we're referring to as jitter here. And, um, you know, we've, we've continued to evolve our craft. Um, but we took a look around recently and realized that a lot of people had stopped really thinking about music in terms of listening to an LP or listening to a CD. They started thinking about how they could live with music in their lives in a, in a different way and applying the power of um, amazing user interfaces that processors, high power processors have given us to organize your music in a different way so that you can have access to it um, in different locations and also have access to a much, you know, right at your fingertips, just a, a larger offering. And so basically we kind of found ourselves, you know, 22 years later saying, well, CDs are, are great and that's a huge part of digital audio, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's no longer the driving force. And so we said, well, what are people listening to? And we, everybody kind of laughed and said, well, everybody listens to iPods. And we all chuckled and kind of said, yeah, ha ha, iPods. But then we thought about it and we said, you know what? It's just digital audio. It, it, and if you put 
the content on an iPod in a full resolution file, well then, in theory, that's going to be equal to what's recorded on the CD, you know, if you're starting with the same amount of data. We thought, boy, if we could get it off digitally, then the only limitation would be the quality of the system. And we all know about high performance systems. It's something that we're all probably pretty passionate about. And I hope you're learning to be more passionate about it while you're here. Um, but we said, okay, let's see if we can figure this out. And uh, we have been tracking another industry. We've been tracking the automobile industry and learned that some people were starting to do work there. And it tipped us off that it was possible. So we researched uh, uh, the, the technology behind the iPods and realized that they were, in fact, capable of delivering digital data. Um, and uh, so we approached Apple with the idea and we said, you know, would it be okay if we accessed the content on your iPod? digitally and provided it in an output format that could work with other people's audio systems, um, a standardized format. And uh, they said yes, and we fainted. We passed out. <laughs> We're like, really? Yeah. We, can, we, we can do this? And um, so, so we introduced a product uh, um, uh, about a year and a half ago called the iTransport, the 170 iTransport. And, and what it does is it provides a bridge. It's simply just a, a, an iPod dock. Um, we think it's nice and it's well engineered, um, and, but, uh, but it's an iPod dock, you know, and that doesn't sound too fancy or special. But what, what, what is great about this product is it really truly does provide access to the content, uh, uh, the digital content. So now your limitation is the quality of the files that you put on your iPod, and if you if you're putting them on your into iTunes in a WAV format, a full resolution format, or even an Apple lossless format, and then you're um, using you know, iTunes to load the music onto your iPod and dock your iPod into our dock, uh, then the output is the full resolution file digitally. So now if you use a very high quality DAC, uh, we offer DACs too, by the way. <laughs> but uh, if you use a very high quality DAC, um, a DDA converter, either it could be in a, a preamp processor for home theater, it could be in a home theater receiver, it could be in an audio product that has digital inputs, it could be in a dedicated digital to analog converter. But um, the, 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 the limitation now is no longer the quality of the DACs inside of the iPod, the limitation is the quality of your system. And so I think we have um, convinced people that this can be a very serious um, audiophile tool in a, in a real way to enjoy the amazing um, usability and, and uh, uh, user interface of the iPod and yet still have high performance. So, and, and what's been exciting too is this has kind of taught us to think differently about digital audio in general. And so we're working now very hard to provide um, ways to allow digital audio wherever it comes from, from a computer via USB connection or uh, from a, uh, a satellite tuner or from wherever the data may come, provide a intuitive and simple path into your DDA converter wherever it is in your system. Hopefully it's ours, but, and then, uh, and then convert it with high performance. So we're doing a whole bunch of interesting products and some of them are pretty darn affordable too. Uh, the iTransport retails for $379, so we're, for us that was a, a real <laughs> miracle. We've never done a product prior to that less than several thousand dollars. So, um, And uh, we have more products coming that are, are kind of what we're calling our affordable performance series and uh, trying to uh, provide a path for more people to enjoy music however they like to listen to it and really experience uh, you know, what we're all here for, which is ultimately a celebration of music. So. Great. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, well now we're finished. Um, no, actually, we're not finished. Um, we're going to do questions. Hopefully, you we have some questions in the audience, and there are things people can write down, because I figure if you can't write the question on the 3x5 three, three card, it's probably way too complicated for <laughs> us to answer, or of such a personal nature that you best deal with somebody directly. Um, I have a few questions. I, I'm usually, I'm, I try to be a nice guy, and, and, but now I get to ask some questions that if I wasn't a nice guy, I might ask um, what I call hardball questions. Um, 
So I guess the first one, I'll, I'll start with Steve Nugent. And there are a number of people, in, um, manufacturers in the industry, who are adamant about the fact that um, asynchronous is the only way to move data through a USB connection. Mm -hmm. um, your devices do not use that, that methodology. And I'd like my, I guess my question is, is why and do you feel that the synchronous method does have the capability to be equal or better, maybe even better than uh, asynchronous? Uh, I wouldn't say better. No, asynchronous is a, is a uh, you know, it's, it's a fundamentally, technically superior method. However, because uh, it's it's it, kind of pulling the data through, right? It's, it's requesting the data, the data as it needs. But it comes it. with some it comes with some baggage. And the baggage is that <clears throat> if you're going to support all the sample rates, you're going to have to buy two clocks. And if you need two good clocks, that can get quite expensive. So, you know, it's it's kind of like buying a CD player that supports all the different formats or DVD player, you know, they, they have actually a, a clock chip that they develop for a DVD player, and you put one crystal in, 27 megahertz, and it synthesizes all the other frequencies, right? Uh, or you can buy a CD player that has all individual clocks in it, which is going to be very much more expensive, especially if they're very good low jitter clocks. So it's like that kind of thing. There's, a, there's baggage that comes with it. There's also the baggage of how is it supported on the computer end? on the software end. How complicated is that? And, and, and is there, are there legacy pro issues with it? And it turns out that um, you in order to support asynchronous format on USB, you really have to have a USB 2.0 compliant, and you have to have latest, latest OS, or you're going to run into trouble. And in fact, I've found, because I also use asynchronous USB, and I use asynchronous uh, FireWire as well. That if I don't have the latest and greatest computer with extra memory, I still get pops and ticks. I still have problems. It's not a panacea. And like I say, it's, you're going to spend more money. You're going to have to have the latest computer. It's got to be USB 2.0. And not all USB 2.0 ports are the same either. Some have higher latency. Some have lower latency. So you may have to even experiment with ports till you get one that works well for you. So, you know, my product, what it does, it takes, you know, uh, uh, an older technology, which is, which was developed by Texas Instruments, and takes it to its limit. So it is uh, adaptive mode USB, but, but it it, what it does is it. Um, It, it achieves the kind of performance you can get with asynchronous by using that old technology. And, and so how do you do that? How does that happen? Well, it, it's implementation, really. It's, it's, it's careful circuit design. It's, it's careful selection of clocks. It's dealing with the uh, transmission line effects. It's you know, all of those things. It turns out that there are certain chips that are better than other chips. Right? There's the chips that you can get from TI, which are plug and play, USB and and adaptive mode. And I've modded those, and I've put good clocks on them. And frankly, there's no help for them, right? <laughs> there's no help for them. You can't make that sound good. On the other hand, there are some good chips from TI that you can make them sound phenomenal because the design of the phase lock loops are really well done. And the phase lock loops are not like your typical analog phase lock loop. It's a digital phase lock loop that really decouples you quite a bit. So even though the incoming stream, it, you're synchronizing to it, it's a very loose coupled synchronization. And because of that, the jitter can be extremely low. So, I mean, you can take, there are other chips that do similar kinds of things, like the, uh, uh, oh, this new DAC chip that's used in the Buffalo DAC. Uh, what's it called? The Sabre. Sabre. The Sabre uses some very clever techniques to do PLLs that are digital that ex you get very, very low uh, jitter from them. So, you know, it's those kind of things that, that allow you to take adaptive to the limit. So, you know, if you put all in, and what happens is now you've got something that you can use with your old computer and it doesn't have pops and ticks. You don't have to buy a new computer. 
You also have something that, um, you know, the old software is going to work with it. You don't have to have the latest OS. Okay. You know. A, so, a long answer to a short pointed question, yeah. but that's okay. That's why we're so, here. So those are the, and, and finally the, the cost. The cost is cheaper of building that thing. Okay. Yeah. So for, for Jonathan Reichbach, um, Amara, which I don't know if anyone, in the, has anyone in the audience had a chance to use Amara? I see a few hands. Um, have you all noticed an improvement in your sound using Amara versus not using it? You have. You have. Okay. You have. Well, God, that's 75%. Damn. My question's irrelevant. No. Um, I've noticed that um, both on the web and from my personal experience that sometimes Amara makes a difference and sometimes it doesn't. And I, uh, my question to you is why would that be? Um. It's, a, not a, it's not an easy question to answer sometimes, meaning people have asked me all the time, why does it sound better? I think it's a combination of everything, actually, from the, when the music was recorded till it comes out your speaker. It's the whole process from one end to the other. And so, you know, I can say that if you don't have a, a good enough resolution playback system, you may not notice the difference. Um, that's certainly one aspect. Some other aspects we've heard, or at least I've conjecture on my part as to what I think it may be. Part of it could be the computer that you're using. Uh, you know, we should think of these computers as audio devices, not as our home office computer, okay? So if you're going to use a home office computer as a digital uh, playback device, then you're already uh, shortchanging the quality that you can get. So I think it's a combination. The other part I think it could be is also the music that you're listening to, uh, meaning when was it recorded, what was it mastered on, and uh, what is the quality of the music, meaning music that has more dynamic range will probably sound better, you'll probably hear the difference. Music that's overly compressed, you may not. So, so those are the things that make the difference. The other thing that I think makes the biggest difference actually is the resolution of the music. Um, when you listen to something at 96K or 170 or 192, the difference in quality over 441 is pretty darn dramatic. So I think the resolution of the music also makes a difference. So, and the very last thing that I've noticed with a lot of folks who've tried our software over the last year is it seems to be something that you have to use for a couple of weeks, take it away, and then you'll notice that there's a difference. So it's somewhat subtle. Uh, and I've heard that more often than not that after uh, 30 days of using it, they don't want to give it up because there's a difference. That's why you only have a 30-day trial before you cut it gets cut off, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Give them the first taste for free. I understand that works very well. Um, if anyone has any questions they've written down, if they can start like passing them forward so I can make sure that we have a flow and I, people don't end up sitting here doing nothing for a while. Um, Mike, I guess the question I'm going to ask you, you get the easy question. You, this is your fellow journalist, so I kind of get to do a soft <laughs> question to you. But, I guess um, I'm, the, I'm the dumb bum in the room, I guess. Yeah. Well, Go yeah. Um, what would you consider the lowest resolution f digital files that still retains enough music to be listenable? And also, I'll, let, I'll divide that question into digital files versus streaming. Okay. 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 Um, Again, not to bite off your answer, John, but I think a lot of this actually does depend on the music again because, you know, being also a DJ and producer and dealing a lot with electronic music, um, you know, a lot of it, yes, is very linear if it's minimal techno or house, but a lot of it isn't. A lot of it's very complex. Some of it lends itself to be compressed and can still sound pretty darn dynamic. I mean, I've DJed in clubs or I've, you know, played on machines in clubs and I've had someone record it on a, you know, Creative Lab Zen hard drive at like 128, literally, or like 96, and play it back and I go, there's, there's no way there's that much bass there. What? What? And, uh, you know, then I've heard like a, a Dirty Projectors track or a Jack Johnson track, you know, compressed that much and it's god awful. So again, I think a lot of it depends on the music. I think for me, not talking about streaming, um, the least, you said the lowest resolution that's like manageable? Well, 
I'm a confessed music addict too, so I listen to a heck of a lot of music that doesn't sound good at all because I love the music. But I would say that 96, you know, is probably the lowest that I deal with that I'm like okay with. But again, uh, and for streaming, um, you and I, I think touched on something, Stephen, in an email. Like I, one of the sites I grab music from is Last FM. You pointed out that they're currently low res, which they're working on. But I just happen to love the interface. I love the way this, they support independent artists. You have incredible access to music. And so I don't mind the low res. Um, so when it comes to streaming, probably a little, maybe, maybe 128, maybe a little more. But again, it really depends on the music. And I know this sounds silly, guys. I mean, but I've been doing this a long time. You know, from behind the desk, you know, in a console in a studio, mixing down, even you know, doing some mastering, all of it, and yeah, it depends on the music. I mean, I have a, I have a highly compressed file of this record by Swayzak called "Snowboarding in Argentina," which it's this killer minimal like spacey tech house record. It's all machines like Roland TB303, 909. It's none of it's like software driven. You sort know, it's all analog hate. big music. And I've heard that crunch to with uh, like so far compressed and still has this dynamic punch to it. You know, so I do think it depends so on the music. The, di the, music. The, the dynamics of the music. Okay. Last for for uh, John Schaefer. Um, Given the price point of the Apple TV and the Mac Mini, uh, do you still feel that the iTransfer has a, a viable market at its price point? Oh, yeah. Um, so I think that the uh, Mac Mini and the Apple TV are fantastic. And, you know, I think that, the again, you know, the user interface uh, that Apple provides across the board is sensational. And those are wonderful devices and, and brilliant ways to experience more music and probably more systems and more places around your house. But we just realized everybody has an iPod. So <clears throat> look at we're not we're not saying this should be your primary source. Um, but we're just saying that if you have an iPod and you want to listen to it through your system, we're gonna provide a great bridge, an elegant bridge. And that's that's really the the only thing we're saying. We're not saying throw out your turntable, throw out your C D player. Absolutely not. I mean celebrate music wherever you have it. And if a friend comes over with a track that you don't have and they have it on their iPod, now you can just dock it and take a listen and it'll sound really as good as the quality of the recording. And you know, when it comes to, but let me just talk about a couple of other things. When it comes to uh, the, the resolution, one of the things that, like for example, your point about the dynamic contrast even when uh, you have a lot of compression, mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely true. You can have really wonderful dynamics, but what we've observed consistently is so much is dependent upon the um, the method of the compression, but it also it, it different compression methods affect uh, the music differently. Absolutely. But there's another huge concern, and that is, like for example, dynamics. They might say whoever designed this uh, uh, a codec for compressing out. Um, musical information said I prioritize these things so I'm going to hold them together but these things are less important and they're going to they're going to disappear and where you almost always hear a huge compromise with compressed audio is in the uh, the, the spatial representation your staging yeah. and and uh, so so one of the things that I would encourage you to do is it you know always utilize the highest resolution available but celebrate music so if you only have it available in low resolution great but but please <laughs> always record at the highest possible level you can. Mm -hmm. And when you have tools like John offers that allows you to use iTunes at even uh, greater than 1644.1, embrace that and utilize that because the spatial representation that you will get will allow you to really um, feel like you're transported to the environment where the recording was captured. And that is so critical to perpetuating the illusion of the realness of the experience. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're all here because we're pretty serious about audio. So, you know, always, always please utilize the highest resolution you possibly can. Okay, I'm going to move on to the first questions from the floor. Um, 
Well, and the first question is, what's the best uh, full resolution format to download music in? To download, to download music. That one threw me a little bit because yeah. the full resolution format, we can go to the argument of which is better, WAVE or AIFF. <coughs> I know, Steve Nugent, you feel that WAVE has certain advantages. Um, being an ergonomic man, I would counter that WAVE has the issues of trying to incorporate metadata and album art. It makes it so you have to either convert it to AIFF, add your metadata, and then convert it back to WAVE, and life is too short for me personally to do that for what small incremental improvement there might be sonically versus those two 44-1 formats. But in terms of res full resolution, I mean, a lot of people like FLAC for, and FLAC for downloading, but FLAC for iTunes is really not a great thing to do. Uh, it means sure. you're going to have to do some, you're going to have to convert, right? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Absolutely. given that, you've got AIFF, you've got uh, WAVE. Our, our, our recommendation for a Macintosh is AIFF for the, for the metadata. There's right. no question about it. Right. Um, we also recommend, you know, if you're going to try to download a 192 album, you're not going to do it uncompressed uh, because it's going to take a day and a half. So we would also strongly encourage that all digital downloads, at least of high resolution material, will be FLAC, probably. Mm -hmm. We would also then probably recommend that the FLAC be converted to AIFF. And for, what conversion iTunes. program do you recommend for that? Um, Max is one program that we use. I, I should say we're in the middle of integrating FLAC uh, into Amara right now. Um, iTunes is not the iTunes can play FLAC files natively. I don't know if anyone's tried to do that. Yeah. It's a little problematic, um, but it is doable and it does work just fine. But uh, we would actually recommend, and in talking with a couple of the distributors, uh, downloading it in some comp lossless compressed format and then uncompressing it to either AIFF if you're on a Mac or Wave if you're on a PC. Okay. That's that's interesting because I was gonna I was gonna say Wave for PC. Yeah. Yeah, because of so the it really is reason. is um, machine dependent. Which the biggest issue is the metadata. Right. Right. Otherwise, mm -hmm. there isn't an issue. So that brings up the next question, which is, what in your opinion is the best basic computer for audio? Basic level computer, and I guess we can could could divide that into two categories, for the Mac, and then for everyone else. I, I I mean I think that's a really tough question, but I'll give you an example. Like in the bedroom, I've been using my my father-in-law gave us his G4, which literally has I think believe it or not, I think 256 megs of RAM, not even close not to even a, a gig. gig, not even a gig, huh? and it sees iTunes, it plays things back in the bedroom fine. It, I've never had an issue with it. I've had more issues on my souped up Dell. You know, so I think, I think stripped down for me, and I use both PC and Mac, so I'm not a, you know, I'm not promoting either one. I say stripped down, I'd say Mac. Also for its, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot more sustainable. I mean, you know, it's a lot more stable, I should say. I mean, that's been my experience. I know we've all had different experiences. But yeah, I've had a lot of customer feedback about Dell, and it's all been negative. So I, that's one that I don't recommend for PCs. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> especially Dell laptops. And I think the problem is primarily folks trying to use USB and FireWire from. Yep. And it's because I think they, the I/O structure inside the computer is is too, it's too shared. There's too much sharing going on. And you know there may be one controller that's doing PCI bus and FireWire and and you know they bought one of these to make the Dell have more profit of course built into it you know instead of having two or three controllers they've got one that does everything and of course it's taxed to the limit and you end up with pops and ticks and you know that kind of problem and so I'd stay away from Dell and but I mean there, you know it really the answer really I think depends on what kind of device you're going to be using with the computer. Uh, you know, like I said, if you're using something asynchronous, you need the latest OS, you need USB 2.0, you need, in general, I found, more memory is better. Dedicate it to the task, uh, even with Mac, Mac mm -hmm. or PC. Mm -hmm. Dedicate it to the task, more memory is better. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting on the computer side is 
and I haven't experienced this myself, because I have, but I do have a unit, and that is to put the OS into into uh, a solid state disk. So there's no spinning disk for the OS, and but mm. not the music, just the OS, mm. and that seems to have a pretty big impact on jitter. Uh, if you you have a jitter sensitive kind of situation, that one is. And I have yet to experience it, but I've had a lot of feedback from the customers that say that's a good thing. And solid-state disks in the past year have gotten quite a bit cheaper to the point that it, there you can get one that's large enough to hold your OS quite successfully um, for a couple hundred bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There may, there may be issues with updates, though, when you try to do a, an OS update. There might, you might have to have a copy of the whole OS on a real hard disk outboard. So, to, so for the for the PC right. people out there though, because I don't want to seem like we're all poo-pooing them, because I use a Dell for the home computer. Um, I've had good experience with HP for a music so server I. and Toshiba. <clears throat> Toshiba, Toshiba laptops are very good. Yes, yes. I have two of them. And so, quick good. question: If you use FireWire, is there a difference between 400 and 800? Is, and is there any sort of audible difference? Uh, there is no difference. Okay, that was quick. We <laughs> like questions like that. I agree. Um, Here's, here's, a, here's a kind of a, a good question. Um, I've heard that Apple lossless files are audibly indistinguishable from, uh, on, from the originals, yet they're 50% smaller. Um, how is, and how, how, how can this be? Wait, did, does yeah. it say meaning audibly there? Indi um, no audibly indistinguishable. Now, yeah. some of us might question that. I uh, question that. I do oh, too. Okay. <laughs> we got two? Do we, do we have older, three? I think I'd say no way. That's not true. I'm yeah. Not for me. Not that true. that would be my unfortunate impression, having quite a few gigs of Apple lossless, that and going back and slowly re-recording it in 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 AIFF. That yeah, there is unfortunately a difference. It's well, not much of a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not the it's not the bits that are different. The bits are no. identical. Yeah, the, it's the, really. You know, let's be honest. It's probably Apple off. lossless and FLAC are, yeah. are bit compatible. They don't lose the bits. Right. I think the issue that people perceive or say is that there is something going on in the decompression in real time on your computer that's affecting the audio quality. And, and, that, and, and that, that is probably what's going that's on. That's probably a processor yeah. issue. So yeah. what's happening is the, uh, the lossless codecs, you know, wh whatever it is, they are lossless. The data is all there. You can, you can, mm -hmm. we've looked at this very carefully and, and mm -hmm. it is, but yet you can very audibly hear the differences mm -hmm. and we attribute it to the quality of the processor in the decode. So when it unpacks it, that's a really critical step. Mm -hmm. And it has to do it with sufficient resolution. And if it does, theoretically, it is as good. So but in, in, in practice, we haven't found too many processors that do that task perfectly. But what you're saying, uh, I kind of hear in the back of my head, the, the optimist in me says, well, golly gee, you mean if I wait a while before I convert over my Apple lossless, the, the, the hardware might get good enough that the conversions be good enough that then I won't hear any difference? Yeah. Wow, it's possible. Uh, but uh, but there's, you mean there's procrastination so has its advantages. There's, there's I would so, say so, that. <laughs> yes, I would say that's it that's does. absolutely the case. But we we were just talking about you know which computer is the best, and you know basically when you're moving digital data around, you're concerned with bit accuracy and time accuracy. You know, so is is, is does it have does your system anywhere in the system have a flaw with getting the bits over correctly and getting them over and then processed? in a way so that there's not corruptions in time. Those are the distortions that ex exist in digital, and then they get stamped to analog, and then we all are more familiar with the distortions that exist in analog, because we've been talking about them for so many years. Mm -hmm. Digital, we're just starting to talk about them, so we're kind of developing our vocabulary and starting to really kind of understand that. But in any system, what you really want to look at is the whole chain and what, what the quality of um, all of the things that impact when you're moving digital data, all of the things that impact bit transparency and time accuracy. Mm -hmm. So if you have a system that can do those two things perfectly, then it's going to be as high performance as the quality of the content. I'll take issue with that. So I'll like. tell you why. <laughs> I think there's actually a third, um, a third uh, leg on the stool that a lot of people aren't aware of. And uh, I became aware of it in the last six months. Um, through a series of experiments, and uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, I have a sort of a software co counterpart on the forums that says you know if you think you're hearing a difference between A and B, 
send them to me. I want to examine these. So I sent these two files to them. This is their identical files. They do their data compares are identical. And I'm hearing differences in them, and my customers are hearing differences in these two files, right? So what is the difference between these files? If it's not the data part, then it's got to be the formatting. Well, and it turns out it, it is actually the formatting. It's, 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 the, um, it, it's the delay or the offset of where this track actually starts. Now, what do you mean exactly? You mean there a certain space or a number of bits before the music yeah, starts? Yeah, before it starts, and also there's trailing, trailing uh, nulls when it, when it ends. And depending on where that's located within those nulls, it can change the sound of the entire track. And that was a shock to me. Okay, and, I, you know, I go, no way. It's like there's this major flaw in either the way the DAD converter works or the way the wave format works or something. I don't know what it is. Maybe John can, but I want to go through, you know, the experiments that I did. So I sent these two files, uh, like I said, to this software expert. He did his analysis. He says, okay, I'm going to take one of these two files since the data is the same, the data block. I'm going to extract the data. I'm going to use my tools. You know, he's using Pro Tools or something to, to create. So, and he says, I'm going to, I'm going to give you um, a header and no trailer. I'm going to give you a header and a trailer and then no trailer. And I'm going to send those two files, and I'm going to tell you which one's which. And he sent them to me, and I have them on my system in my room. Sound A, B, and C, they're called. And all three of them are Led Zeppelin track from the first album. And you oh, can tell something from Oh, that. yeah. <laughs> not only do the three tracks, not only is there one track that stands out from the others and sounds a lot better, all three tracks Wait, sound different from each other. So all three sound different from each other. So this is worse than you can imagine. Yeah, yeah but I would yeah, believe was, that, but there's a distortion happening in one of the steps along the way. Do you see what I mean? It's like it's how it's being processed. But the fundamental distortion is not, it, it, it's changing because of how the processor is interacting with it. And then it's manifesting itself as a timing error right. or a data error. So anyway, yeah, while we're speculating why Apple Lossless sounds funky or why certain rippers sound better than other rippers, I think it may have to do with this offset thing. Okay. That's my speculation. Let's go to something a yep. little Could less be. bleeding <laughs> edge here, just because <laughs> my, little, my little brain is going pop, pop I, I on that one. Like is that interesting or what? Yeah. I'll give that's, you the files. That's really bizarre. Yeah. Is there, like is there is one bizarre. iPod that sounds yeah. better than the others? Oh, this is going to get good. <laughs> I don't know. All right. You, 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 you seem to have, uh, you want to go, go for it. Again, hey, look, I think what a lot of us tend to not call out this particular elephant in the room is that music, audio, art, all art's in the eye of the beholder, right? So a lot of this is subjective. But uh, I held on to my first generation for a very long time. I thought the second generation was better. I don't know what you guys thought. Um, I thought the second gen, I don't remember, now they call it classic. The classic. Right. Classic. I, they call it the classic, right? Yes, so I think my original version of that, to me and to my wife especially, so she called it first. She, she thought I was playing a different CD player or something, literally. Um, sounds better than like my 4 gig newer Nano by far. Okay. And I, maybe I'm crazy, and that's a possibility. No, no, no. So, especially for if you're listening you know. analog, absolutely that's the case because the quality of the deck, they used to use Wolf. The yeah. They used to use a Wolfson deck that was right. really nice. Uh, sure. And then they switched to a deck that we think is a lesser deck. Okay. But there, but but even if interestingly, even if you use our i transport and you're listening to different current generation iPods, you do you, if you have a high resolution system, you will hear differences between them. And uh, so there, are, and, and that's because our system is not 100% jitter immune. No system is. Our system is really minimal jitter, but jitter is something that we all perceive um, relatively easily because our, the way that our hearing has evolved over time, we're really good at spatial anomalies. We're really good at picking that information up. And it's very subtle, but you can hear differences. Um, so one, one of my favorite, if you're using a digital, if you're using an analog output, I agree, the, the older, the earlier generation, uh, what they call the iPods, the, the, the standard iPod. The classic. With, with well, before the classic. Before well, the, the, the generation one. three or generation <coughs> four. Or gen, you like generation two. Generation you have, how many batteries have you replaced in that sucker? Yeah. I'm not 
I'm not disclosing it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you, no, no, but to take it further, and again, um, sometimes you find things like, like audio gear. Sometimes you find different components that seem to marry so well, and there's no rhyme or reason for it. I found this little mustard seed headphone amp. I don't know why this would make it better, but that on the second generation iPod. I've tricked a lot of audio files into thinking they were listening to my EAD transport in the musical Fidelity DAC. That's nasty. <laughs> That's evil. Actually, I know it's evil, but I, you got to do it to show them, hey, look, this can sound good. And in terms of iPods, I encourage everyone in the room to make some time to go over to the Can Jam room yes. and spend some time hearing some of the really amazing headphones and headphone amp rigs that you can take and put with your iPod. Some of them will just blow your mind. Will, I was yeah. listening to one over there. It was like, and it was it was it wasn't even an Apple lossless file. I was listening to a 320 uh, MP3 file, and it sounded amazing. Um, how, how many people are still using the earbuds that came with your iPod? Anybody? Oh, get rid of them. Replace oh. those. <laughs> Replace those. Just you're missing. You're, you're, you're really missing so much. Terrible. Those are and, terrible. And, you, and, and can you ear. actually make them fit in your ear? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more to me. Too, they, you're hurting yourself with those. Oh yeah. You know your potential hearing problems. They nasty. All They're right. Uh, one one more one more question. Um, this one makes me sad. Um, I have a 500 gigabyte hard drive full of CDs in WAV files that are ripped with Windows Media Player. Ooh. I've tried several ways to import them into iTunes, and uh, he's getting no luck with this. Does yeah. anyone have any suggestions besides? Um, uh, yeah, no, I can't say that in public. Um, <laughs> any, any suggestions of things to do besides uh, suicide? Um, <laughs> Convert them to wave or, or convert them know. to yeah. AFF. Well, it sounds like they're in wave, but it sounds like it's a problem of trying to bring them into the catalog and having it recognize them. I mean, I'll admit, I once my stupidest stupidest move I ever did in iTunes is I once moved all my library onto an external hard drive and did it manually and didn't let iTunes do it. And then oh. I went in and, and you know and told it that's where the library is. And I went in and I went to play the first thing. It I went, cannot thing. find file. <laughs> uh -huh. Went to the second one and said, cannot find file. And, and then this chill started to go down <laughs> my back. And, and then I spent the next three hours you know, going <clears throat> by hand. At, this was like, this was over a thousand. This was a lot of things. It, it, the only way I could do it was actually manually tell it each time because they need. This was an earlier version of iTunes. I don't know if you, if anyone's running the latest iTunes, which is 9.01. Which is you awesome. may have noticed that it no longer has the consolidate library feature. Mm -hmm. That's because iTunes now does that automatically for you. Anytime you bring in a new file, you double click on it. iTunes opens up. One of the things iTunes will do is copy that file from wherever it is into the iTunes library folder for you. Which you used to have so to in theory, it can never do what I just managed to do <laughs> a couple of years ago. So, but do we have um, a solution for this gentleman? Because so obviously, he sounds like he's in the situation. He's got the large library. iTunes is not recognizing it because it hasn't really ever brought it into iTunes. Can I, can I ask? Because I don't know which version Windows Media, but and again, if I'll have our opinions. I can't stand Windows Media Player. Because a lot of the times, like, were you able to, do you, could you find where all the files are? Yeah, I can find the okay. files, but so, you can't get the metadata and the crossover. What, uh, ha, have you tried, <coughs> so you know, you've, you, you know where the directory is, where the files are located. Mm -hmm. um, you can always reload it. So a friend of mine did this, and it worked. Yeah. I'm not promising anything. But you can actually keep, so you have your iTunes, and iTunes is set as the default player. So when you double right? click on so, a music file, iTunes opens up? Yeah. Okay. okay. Pull Windows Media Player, just take it off the machine, and then try it. Stop I don't know, it. my friend, it worked for my hmm. buddy. Well, but my problem with Windows Media was always trying to get those files out into anything else. I mean, that's part of the reason why I couldn't stand it. Because you can always reload it back. You can always load Windows Media back up for free, and you know, if it doesn't work. But that, what might happen, this is what happened to my friend is that when he did that, you know how when iTunes is the default player and you look at your music files, they'll look like an iTunes file. You'll see that icon? Well, that happened when he took when he removed Windows Media from the machine and then he just clicked and he was going. 
I, th I think the big thing to do, especially if you're concerned about the metadata, is just convert it to AIFF, which is the Apple version of a WAV file. It's a full resolution file. Mm -hmm. And they identify it by flipping the bit at the beginning. Um, some people claim they hear a difference, but if you look at the data set, it looks the same. So if there is an audible difference, I think it comes down to what Steve was talking about. But Isn't well, the left and right? It's out of order, though. It starts, instead of left, right, it starts, it goes right, left. Yeah, that's all it does. Though. That's the it. The data set is yeah. the same. But oh, the so it's actually, dyslexic. Apple changed that this year. Did they? Oh, they uh, changed AIFF it. AIFF files on Apple's of this year are now byte swapped. They are now byte compatible with the WAV files. Okay. They yeah. didn't tell anyone that they did. Didn't tell that. anyone. Oh, well, that's <laughs> interesting to that. know. Yeah. Good. And, but the thing that's absolutely Maybe true fix is it. Apple no, allows the same. metadata yeah. to come through in the AIF format. So you're going to capture all that information and allow the experience to be so much nicer because then you have all the information and the artwork allowing the, you know, what we're talking about is how much we enjoy that user interface and then how do we make it sound good. Well, you've got to first start by being able to enjoy that interface. So that's so important that you have all of that metadata available. So, so convert it to an I was going to say, do you, do you think you should do the How do you convert it? File? You, you can use iTunes to convert yeah, it. Yeah, iTunes will do that conversion for you. So he opens up, oh, he opens and he looks for it in iTunes. Probably the best. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You can convert the entire library. Right. Yeah. I tried your, your method at one time, and with one album, but then I could manually index it on one. I tried to import 20 albums. I got 20 track ones, 20 track uh, two, track three. Oh, because it, uh, oh, yeah, I've been there. Nightmare. Yeah, because so, a lot of stuff I get is live, and they didn't put the digital information in. I would just... Put it. Put the info on first, and, and you can go into Get Info yes, and hand in. write that in. And yeah. the nice thing about iTunes is it will remember if you type the first couple letters. It'll try to auto suggest, like on a, on a cell phone, where you know you mother you to M O, and it'll go mother. Is that what you want versus mom? Um, but yeah, that's. These things aren't perfect. They try to anticipate what most people are going to do. And for most people, they work fairly well. Um, I guess to kind of wrap this up and paraphrase, the, the thing that we seem to share in common is the most important thing you can do to maximize the quality of iTunes or iPod is use the high, highest resolution files possible.